so thank you uh, everyone uh, for being here. Um, and yeah, hopefully uh, that uh, today um, will be helpful in uh, some way. And uh, yeah, let's get started. Um, so uh, what's the topic of today's uh, presentation? So I'm gonna share my screen now. Let's see if this works. It works, okay. So um, the topic of today's presentation, uh, as you have already seen, is about developing executive functioning uh, skills for students with uh, learning differences. Um, so the key focus today here is going to be on uh, these executive functioning skills. Um, and before I get started, uh, the key research that's used in this presentation. So what did I study? Uh, what did I read? Um, where did I... Yeah, where did I collect um, all of the information I'm sharing with you from? And it's mainly from the work of um, these following uh, people. The first is Ross Green. Uh, he's a psychologist. Um, he's wrote many, many uh, incredible books uh, about skills um, in general. He doesn't uh, specifically call them executive functioning skills. More around, he uses the term <laughs> cognitive skills sometimes. Uh, but he's uh, the two books that I've read by him that are contributing to this presentation are the Explo the explosive child that's more for parents uh, and lost at school which is more for teachers. Uh, I've also read uh, the works now of Peg Dawson and Richard Guar who have co-authored many incredible books that are um, completely focused on executive functioning skills. And those books are Smart But Scattered, um, Smart But Scattered Teens. So Smart But Scattered is more for um, children um, and before the age of 13. And then Smart But Scattered Teens, which is more towards adolescence. Uh, Coaching Students with Executive Skills Deficits, um, which is a book entirely about executive function uh, skills coaches, executive functioning skills coaches, and also executive skills in children and adolescents, which is more geared towards teachers. Okay. Um, so that's the key research that's being focused on this presentation. So what are the key ideas um, to remember uh, as um, we go throughout this talk? Um, because I'll, I'll go over them uh, many times. And here are the key ideas, the following. Number one, executive skills, what they are, executive functioning skills, sometimes they're um, referred to as executive skills, but executive functioning skills are the skills that basically you need to get things done. So to get things done, things is very, things can be anything, which is why this works very well. Executive functioning skills are the skills you need to get things done. Uh, and that's from Peg Dawson and Richard Boyle. Uh, the next one is from Ross Green. And it's, this is an incredible life-changing uh, um, sort of way to look at things. And it's that it is not that students do well if they want to, it's students do well if they can. Um, and What's being said here is they can do well if they have the skills that they need. Uh, next one is that kids are lacking the skills necessary uh, to do well and be successful. Oh, uh, so someone just join. Uh, could could um could please uh, microphones off? Hello. Hello. Can you keep uh? If the microphone is on, could you mute it, please? Um, okay, uh, we'll keep going. Um, the next key idea to remember is that kids are lacking the skills necessary to do well and be successful. And the last idea, and this is both from Ross Green and uh, Peg Dawson and Richard Guar, is that adults, uh, we have a responsibility to act as a surrogate frontal lobe uh, for students and for children who have uh, executive functioning skill deficits. Uh, surrogate frontal lobe basically means we need to be there frontal lobe for them. Uh, and I, I noticed from the list of people attending that there's um, some Japanese uh, speakers where English is a second language. Uh, executive functioning skills in Japanese is jiko kino. Uh, I think that's right. And I'm, uh, I think that's the right term. Uh, just so, and at the end of this presentation, I'll share some uh, Japanese resources, uh, videos, um, or English videos with Japanese subtitles, and also some Japanese videos. Anyways, so uh, let's continue. 
So um, the first thing we want to look at, and this will um, make everything a lot more clear, is the brain. Um, so we're going to look at the brain and how it's important in understanding executive functioning skills. Um, so a part of the brain, which is uh, the prefrontal cortex, is where these executive functioning skills typically are developed. Um, and the prefrontal cortex... Today. Oh, um, could we please mute uh, microphones if, um, if possible, please? Okay, thank you. Um, so the prefrontal cortex, why it's important, this is where executive functioning skills are developing. And it's important because we need to know that this part of the brain is the last part of the brain to fully develop. So actually this part of the brain fully develops typically around age 25. What this means is that these executive functioning skills as well do not fully develop, typically do not fully develop until around age 25. So typically it's very common uh, to have a person before the age of 25 struggling with any of these executive functioning skills. What's even more important for us to know is that students with learning differences, and here our focus is on ADHD, they can be even further delayed in terms of this full development. So for example, student with ADHD can be up to five years delayed in this full development. And if we look at brain scans, uh, we can visibly see less cortical maturation. So less development in this part of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, which is the crucial area of the brain where these executive functioning skills develop. So that's what's scientifically we have evidence to show us that it is typical for these executive functioning skills not to be fully developed before the age of 25 and typical to see them delayed past the age of 25 in full development uh, for some students with learning differences with a key focus here on ADHD. Um, so what we see here is a picture of the brain and where the prefrontal cortex is located is here, uh, which is um, shown here in blue. Uh, so this is the prefrontal cortex. This is the last part of the brain to fully develop. And in the prefrontal cortex, the skills or what, what is uh, going on here, what's being developed is executive functioning skills, behavior, and personality. Very important for getting things done, uh, being successful uh, with what you're trying to get done. Um, so what does this all mean? Uh, what, what, what does this mean? Could you please mute your microphones if possible? Uh, what does this all mean? Uh, it means that students with executive functioning skill deficits need more support um, because they have not fully developed these skills. We have evidence, scientific evidence to show this, that these skills are not fully developed. Uh, and we also know that some students are going to be strong in some of the executive functioning skills, but weak in others. We also know we have scientific evidence to show us that students with learning differences and the focus here, and this is from Dawson and Guar's research, is that students with ADHD, autism spectrum disorder, oppositional defined disorder, and dyslexia will typically struggle with these executive functioning skills. Uh, Russell Barkley, who's one of the main researchers on ADHD, says that ADHD is basically just executive functioning skill deficits. So now what we're thinking is, what, so what are these executive functioning uh, skills and it has kind of a scary name because it's not so clear what these skills are. Executive functioning is two pretty big words, so it can be a little scary, uh, but it's not. They're very, very simple and straightforward. And now we're going to find out uh, what they are. Um, many different, uh, you know, di there's different research on the executive functioning skills. Some research says that there's about five, some says there's maybe 22. I've heard even more than 22, uh, but since we're focused on the research of Richard, uh, sorry, Peg Dawson and Richard Guar, um, they identify 12, and that's what we're gonna go with, 12 executive functioning skills that have been identified by them. And here's the full list. Uh, the first one is emotional control. This one's very straightforward. It is the skill, the skill of being able to control your emotions. So right away, we see a skill that is essential Essential, vitally important to get things done, to be successful in what you're trying to get done. Um, the next skill is flexibility. Um, so flexibility, 
uh, very straightforward as well, is basically being able to handle uh, new and unfamiliar situations. So you're used to something, you're used to it, you know it, you understand it, and then something new comes. And can you be flexible and can you handle it? That's flexibility. Uh, Goal-directed persistence um, is the next one. And goal-directed persistence is the ability to set goals for yourself and follow through uh, in um, pursuing those goals. And yeah, basically not giving up on goals that you uh, set for yourself. Uh, oh, I, I just wanted to add as well. In this uh, presentation, we have a few teachers who I think are a part of this presentation. So at the end, uh, when there are questions and um, parents, please ask questions at the end. Uh, teachers, please add your own sort of perspectives or um, your own experiences or your own uh, knowledge when it comes to executive functioning skills uh, at, at the end of the presentation uh, towards any question, please, it would be very helpful. Um, so, okay, let's get back to it. Number four is metacognition. So this is, should actually be at the end here, the end of the list, and I'll explain why later. But metacognition is what they say is the most important executive functioning skill. It's also the last one from Peg Doss and Richard Ward's research, the last one to develop. And metacognition is basically being able to think about your thoughts. So it's to be aware of your thought processes, to think about your thought processes. Now this is crucial, extremely important because your thoughts dictate more or less everything. Your thoughts dictate your emotions, uh, your thoughts dictate your actions. So if you can control your thoughts, you are much more capable of handling any of these skills, being flexible, emotional. So this is the most important one and the last one to develop. Uh, organization, that one's straightforward. That's one of these 12 executive functioning skills, being organized, planning and prioritizing. So this is being able to make plans and being able to prioritize what's most important when you set plans is um, another one of the 12 executive function skills. Uh, response inhibition. So this is one of those that's very technical. They should have probably come up with a better, uh, easier to understand uh, uh, term here, but response inhibition is very, very simple and straightforward too. Response inhibition is being able to control your impulses. Uh, it's impulse control. So response inhibition, you can inhibit a response to something. So impulse control, I really, really wanna watch YouTube right now. I have homework to do, but I really, really wanna watch YouTube. There's a video I really wanna watch. Being able to control that impulse to not watch YouTube and to stay focused on the homework, to not read a message from somebody and stay focused on the homework, that's response inhibition as a skill. Um, I wrote an asterisk here next to stress tolerance. That's because this is more an executive functioning skill uh, displayed in adults. Uh, so it's not included in a lot of the research by Peg Doss and Richard Guar for children and adolescents, but it's included on, on their list for adults, children, and adolescents. So I wrote an asterisk here, but this one's very simple too. It's being able to find coping strategies to deal with stress. That's this executive functioning skill. The next one is sustained attention. Um, that's the skill of being able to stay focused on something for extended periods of time. The next one is task initiation. This is also another very technical one, but very simple and straightforward actually. And task initiation is basically being able to get started on something, uh, especially being able to get started on something that you don't really want to do, uh, which could be a homework assignment, could be studying for a test, writing an essay, this skill is the skill of being able to get started on something, especially when you don't like it. So it's basically the opposite of procrastinating. Being good at task initiation means that um, you're not someone who procrastinates. Okay, next one is time management. Time management is very straightforward too, uh, but basically what it is is being able to manage your time well. And this includes being able to uh, have a good estimate, a good guess of how long something is going to take. So a big issue that I see with students, and I think many teachers will agree with this, is we see students um, who struggle with two things in time management. One of them is they overestimate how long is something something's going to take. So they're too, um, let's say, they don't really want to do it because they think it's going to take too long. So they overestimate it, and that prevents them from getting it done. And then the other one is they underestimate how long it's going to take. And then they wait until the last minute to do it and realize, ah, I ran out of time. Uh, and that's 
within this scale of time management. And then the last one is, uh, oh, excuse me. The last one is working memory. And working memory is basically uh, the skill of being able to remember what you've learned from past experiences and to apply it in the present moment. Um, so this is, of course, as you can uh, understand and imagine, extremely important because um, we're able to make a decision uh, based on what's the best thing to do right now, based off what we've learned or experienced in the past. And this is a skill that, well, many people, many children, many adolescents, many students will struggle with. All right. So um, Peg Dawson and Richard Guar, they break down these skills uh, into two categories. The first category is the foundational skills. And what's meant by that is these are the skills that need to develop first. So these skills have to develop first before the skills, which are in the other category, advanced skills develop. So the foundational skills, we need these ones to effectively develop first before the advanced skills, because these foundational skills are extremely important in being able to do these advanced skills. In fact, they say response inhibition is the one that needs to develop first because without response inhibition, without the ability, the skill of being able to control impulses, it's very hard to stay organized. You might have a great organizational system, but if you can't control your impulses, it's difficult to keep that system up. You know, you can develop skills for time management, but if you still struggle with impulse control, it's difficult to continue to be successful at managing your time. Uh, so they break it down into these foundational skills uh, that we need first and then the advanced skills after uh, and with metacognition coming last. So um, just as a one minute activity, um, looking at these skills and i wrote the more um more simplified definition in uh brackets after uh parentheses after uh, please take one minute uh to think about which of these 12 executive functioning skills and it can be, definitely be more than one um it could be all of them actually uh which of these 12 executive functioning skills you believe your child or if you're a teacher who's attending this, your student or your students, you can think about multiple students, might be struggling with. So please take one minute to think about that. I have to be good at time management here. When is the minute over? Um, okay, about 20 seconds left. Okay, so um, sorry if that wasn't a lot of time. Uh, of course, um, anytime you can be thinking about this, but that's already the step in the direction of focusing. Let's to focus on these skills. Um, so what we're going to do now, now that we know what the executive functioning skills are, uh, we're going to look at two approaches, two approaches to address these executive functioning skills. What do we do? Okay. We have a child, we have a student, we have an adolescent who has uh, challenges uh, in these executive functioning skills. One, two, three. Okay, what do we do? All right, and we're going to focus on two approaches here. Uh, one of them is Ross Green's collaborative problem solving model or a collaborative and proactive solutions model. Uh, and this is more of an overall approach. He doesn't really focus right on the executive functioning skills, it's more uh, a broad range of skills, but there's a lot of overlap with executive functioning skills. So we're going to take Look at his approach, and then we're going to look at Dawson and Guar's approach. Okay, so let's first look at Ross Green's uh, collaborative and proactive solutions. Also, I, I use collaborative problem solving here, but he refers to it now as collaborative and proactive solutions. So what, do, what, what does he do? What is his approach to all this? How do we help a student, a child, an adolescent who has uh, executive functioning skill deficits? Well, step number one, and well, these are the two main things we need to do is we need to actually realize what skills are actually uh, lagging. So lagging means which skills 
is this student, child, adolescent struggling with? So we first have to really think carefully, okay, what skills is this, um, is this I'm going to use student from now, what skills is this student uh, struggling with? And he used the term lagging skills. So what we're really trying to figure out now, the question we're really asking is, why is this problem happening? And I'll, I'll get into what problem means, but why is this problem happening? And what we need to look at here is we need to think very carefully, what skills might this student be lagging in? And then what we need to do is we need to identify very carefully, what are the unsolved problems that are connected to those lagging skills? So what are unsolved problems? Uh, an unsolved problem is uh, basically um, doesn't brush teeth at night. That could be an unsolved problem. Uh, and I'll, I'll get into, he uses very, we have to be very clear on how to phrase an unsolved problem, but we have to think, what skills might the student be struggling with? And what are some unsolved problems that the student is having? So we need to identify when the problem is happening, because we also need to be able to uh, solve these problems together with the child proactively. And proactively is we, means we do it before the problem might be likely to occur. So we, we solve these problems before they're likely to occur. And because if it's a problem that happens a lot, we can become very good at predicting that it might happen again in the future. Okay, so um, I'm gonna show you, and this is from Ross Green's website, uh, and it, all of this is completely free, which is amazing. Um, this is what he calls the assessment of lagging skills and unsolved problems. So in what I'm about to show you, he actually lists what he believes are the skills that most students, okay, children and adolescents are lagging in. So what skills do we see that are lagging the most in, in students that are having certain challenges in school at home? So let's, let's look at this. All right, and he refers to it as the assessment of learning and unsolved problems. Uh, sorry, assessment of learning. Hold on, it's loading right now. Okay, as it loads, I'm also gonna upload the others. I've also, um, I'm going to share with you, um, sorry, my computer is a little slow. Um, another link from him. Okay, let's see if this is loaded now. Okay, this is loaded. So it's the assessment of lagging skills and unsolved problem. So what unsolved problems? So what skills does he point out? I'm not gonna read them all for the sake of time, but an example of a skill that he identifies as something that will cause problems uh, for, a, uh, for a student is difficulty considering a range of solutions to a problem. All right, so this is basically problem solving is a skill, but let's look at the ones that overlap with executive function skills. Difficulty shifting from original idea, plan, or solution. Can you think of which executive functioning skills this might be connected with? One that comes right away is flexibility, if that's what you were also thinking. Um, also, uh, chronic irritability and or anxiety significantly impeding capacity for problem solving and heightened frustration. Which executive functioning skill does this overlap with emotional control? All right, so all of these skills he lists here in this assessment of lagging skills and unsolved problems. And the goal here is to identify, think very carefully, what is my child, what is my student, what skills is he or she possibly struggling with? Okay, that's step number one. And then the next step is what unsolved problems am I seeing? Uh, what unsolved problems am I seeing with this student or child? So what, what are these problems that they're struggling with? Um, this is, uh, oh, I'll get into that after. I also wanted to point out that um, on Ross Green's website, he has this form in Japanese, actually. So he has all the information uh, translated into Japanese. Uh, I'll show this link after. So you can get everything that he's trying to say, almost everything he's trying to say in Japanese, uh, including a translation of the skills. Um, so, um, so what are some key ideas that we need to focus on here? Because it might not, it might still be not, totally clear what is meant by all this. Here's the Japanese version of um, all these skills that might be lagging for the student or child. So um, I, I'll share my slides so you'll be able to see this link as well. Okay, so what is Ross Green asking us to do? And I'll, hopefully I can make this all more clear right now. Ross Green is asking us or challenging us to enter something he calls a problem-solving mode. 
and this already is this completely changed the way I approach lots of things when the first time I ever read his work or heard him speak is that we need to as much as we can be in what he calls a problem solving mode. So this means not thinking just about the problems. Okay, there's a problem, there's a problem, there's a problem. But as much as we can, thinking as much as we can about solutions. So be in a problem solving mode. Um, and we have to enter this mode in a proactive way, in a proactive way. But it's very important what she points out while we are in a problem solving mode. So this is a big shift already that at some point we're going to find solutions to these problems the child might be dealing with together with the child. We're going to find what they believe are good solutions too. Uh, and if the solution doesn't work, we'll find new solutions. Um, so basically what collaborative problem solving is, is developing lagging skills. Um, and a very important thing to point out here is when we think of problems, um, it's a mistake to think of a problem as screaming. Um, screaming is not a problem. Uh, fighting, getting into fighting, fighting is not a problem. Uh, swearing is not a problem. Um, cheating, uh, okay, but also not, that's not a problem. Um, cheating might be, but okay, screaming, fighting, swearing, those are not problems. Actually, what all of those are, are behaviors. And behaviors are different from problems because behaviors are really just that student or that child's way of communicating. So swearing, fighting, shouting is just that student's way of communicating, but it's not the problem. The problem could be um, it's unable uh, to, uh, Let's look at working memory. So working memory is unable to remember what was learned in yesterday's class and apply it to today's class or unable to remember what my parents said to me yesterday and apply it to doing something well today. Um, that is a problem. That's a problem. But the problem, that's what causes the behavior. But we're not looking to address the behavior. That's the mistake here that we try we need to avoid we need to look to address the problem because if we address the behavior um we're not really teaching anything and a, what he really says is a lot of times we address behavior by punishing the behavior so punishing the shouting punishing the fighting or rewarding when there is no behavior or we create incentives for the behavior if you don't shout if you don't fight you'll receive this but in doing that, we're really not solving the problem that's causing the behavior, and we're really not teaching any skills. So if we punish the shouting, that's a behavior. We're not teaching the skill that's causing the problem, and we're not solving the problem that's causing the behavior. And the other thing to look at here is the behavior, the shouting, the fighting, um, the fighting, the shouting, the swearing. Um, this is a very, very simple, there's a very simple reason this is happening. And the simple reason this is happening is because that student, that child's skills are not meeting the demands of the environment. And what Ross Green says very often, and I completely agree with this, is that that's how all of us get frustrated. All of us get frustrated, adults, any person on the face of this earth, we get frustrated and that's when we, we exhibit behaviors. That's when we shout or we get frustrated or we get down on ourselves. is when our skills do not meet the demands of the environment. So Ross Green, so this is a big shift to think about is Ross Green is saying is with any child, any student, it's not, it's never a motivational deficit. It's not a motivational deficit. It's not that the child doesn't want to do well. It's not a motivational deficit. Every child wants to do well. Every student wants to do well. Everybody wants to do well, at least in the earlier portion of their life. Everyone is born wanting to do well. It's not a motivational deficit. It is a skill deficit. And that's the shift that we have to get. We have to focus on these skills. So the key for us here with Ross Green's approach is we need to understand the child. We need to understand why is this behavior happening? 
Why is this shouting happening? Why is this swearing happening? Why is the giving up on themselves happening? What is the unsolved problem? And what are the lagging skills? That needs to be the focus. So we can focus on this child can do well if they have the skills to do well, to meet the demands of the environment. Um, he even goes as far, well, okay, for the sake of time. Um, so I'm not gonna go over, he has an entire, he calls it plan B, an entire conversational approach to better understanding. Okay, I'll do it really quickly. Um, to better understand what's going on with the child. He calls it plan B and I'll share all of the videos that you need to watch to better understand this, the books as well, all that at the end of the presentation. But he has an approach and it's called plan B. And in this approach, there's three steps. The first step is called the empathy step. And it starts with a question where you ask the child I, or you communicate to the child, I noticed you've been having a difficulty with, and then you say the unsolved problem. If it's something at home, brushing your teeth at night. Or I noticed um, you've been having a difficulty with remembering to study for the tests. That's the unsolved problem. And we have to be very careful the way we were this, but generally it's like this. I've noticed you've been having a difficulty with remembering to study for quizzes and tests. And then ask the question, what's up? And once we ask this what's up question, hopefully, and there's more strategy shares, we, we get the answer to what the unsolved problem is. And then this is when the child might share, well, actually this has been going on or whatever. And they start sharing more with us here. This does not happen if we take the punish the behavior approach or address the behavior approach. Then we define in step two, our concerns. So this would look something like, okay, so you would empathize saying, oh, I understand what the problem is. Yeah, that's totally understandable. My concern is if you don't study for the quizzes, uh, if you forget to study for the quizzes and tests, um, it's going to be very difficult to do well on the quizzes and tests. That's my concern, you share that. And then in the step three is saying, you ask them, so you collaborate for what they think they could be solutions for this. And in all Ross Green's books and the videos, what students, and I'm starting to use this more recently as well, students, the solutions they come up with for their unsolved problems, which already is a big step, which they haven't really thought about, the solutions that these students come up with for solutions for their unsolved problems are fantastic, way better than anything the teacher could come up with. And worth putting into action. Now, another thing to point out here, and so for the sake of time, but he, you know, the, all of this is shared and I'll share it at the end. This needs to happen proactively. So a big mistake is we do it in the moment. So something happens and in the moment we try to have this, this, this makes it way less effective. It needs to be done proactively. So you, you figure out, okay, I've got this unsolved problem. I identified the unsolved problem, have the conversation proactively, and then and then figure out the solution collaboratively. All right, so that's Ross Green. Uh, this, he's incredible, a speaker, his writing, it's so clear, it makes so much sense and it's very practical. Um, so yeah, so that's Ross Green. Now we're gonna move on to Peg Dawson and Richard Gore. So they focus more on these executive skill deficits is what they call them, executive functioning skill deficits. Um, and in Dawson and Gore's work, similar to Ross Green, uh, it's lagging skills. Once again, it's lagging skills. So skills that the students are struggling with. It's these lagging skills that are the underlying, they're the reason, the underlying cause of the students struggling. So it's really, once we break it down and really analyze the situation, it's one of these lagging skills or more than one of these lagging skills that's causing the student to struggle. So we can take away all the theories. We can focus it on this. And a big thing that Peg Dawson and Richard Guar focus on is that language and communication. So the way we communicate with the student, the way we communicate with adults, the way we communicate to ourselves needs to change to have more of a focus on these executive functioning skills. Um, and the key is we need to identify these lagging skills and we need to apply strategies to help these students with working on these skills and developing these skills so they can be successful which they are perfectly capable of doing. They have the potential 100% to be successful, but we need to help them with whatever skills they might be lagging. So once again, Ross Green said, it's, it's not a motivational deficit, it's a skill deficit. 
but it, it might slowly become into a motivational deficit if we don't properly address these skills. And I'll get into that at the end. So Dawson and Guar, they, they talk about communication a lot. And I really agree with what they say here. And this is taken from a, a video with Peg Dawson and a better way to communicate. So instead of calling students lazy, it's better to describe them as having a challenge of task initiation. Rather than saying the student's unmotivated, rather think about it as the student having a challenge in sustained attention. Rather than calling a student not working to potential, say the student, uh, think of it as the student's having a challenge with response inhibition. Disruptive, rather than that, thinking struggling with emotional control. And the list goes on here. As a more effective way and a more productive way to think about what's going on with the student and why they're struggling. And this is in the video that, of course, with way more detail to watch. So this is a full example here uh, with proper communication. So you might say, John, I don't know why I use Johnny as a name. <laughs> anyway, uh, Johnny won't do his homework. So homework is an issue for Johnny. Maybe Johnny was the example in the book. Anyways, homework, it doesn't sound like a name. But homework is an issue for Johnny. So, okay, sorry, I got distracted. Mike. Okay, Johnny won't do his homework. That's something we want to avoid saying. Johnny won't do his homework. We need to think about it in terms of executive functioning skills to get a more productive sort of way of approaching how to help Johnny. So a better way to communicate this is homework is an issue for Johnny. Okay, that's the problem, the unsolved problem. And this is from Dawson Guar, but similar to Ross And then we think about executive functioning skills. Which executive functioning skill can we work on, can we help Johnny with to improve his homework completion? And let's think, is it a sustained attention issue? Perhaps Johnny didn't hear the assignment when the teacher shared it. Is it a planning issue? Perhaps Johnny didn't use a planner to write it down or a plan to finish the homework. Is it a working memory issue? Did they only write down part of the assignment? Is they, can, can they not, is there, are they struggling with that skill, remembering exactly what they needed to do? Is it an organization issue? Did they not have the materials to properly complete the task as a skill? Is it a skill issue of task initiation? Are they struggling to just start something where there's so many strategies to help a student who struggles with starting something? Is that what's going on? Is it a time management issue? Is, is the student unable to realistically estimate as a skill, really realistically estimate how long it's going to take to complete something? I see this so much with students. One of the biggest things holding them back, with, especially with long-term projects, big assignments, is they're either underestimating how long it's going to take and wait until the last minute to do it, or they overestimate how long it's going to take and they're too scared to start it because they think it's going to be such a massive monster which they can't face. And there's strategies to work on that too. Um, all right, so Dawson and Guire, then they identify three ways to help students with executive function skill deficits in this order. So number one, what we can do to help students with executive functioning skill challenges and deficits is change the environment. So there's loads of environmental changes we can help the child with in terms of changing them to help them with at least not having these executive functioning skills, having such a negative impact on their success in school, success at home. So that's the first thing we can do, change the environment. Next thing we can do is we can teach these skills explicitly. So we can teach them and say, okay, this is a skill called this, and here's how we can get better at it. So we can actually teach it. And the last one, and this is where they kind of get a little different from Ross Green, is they say we can use incentives to help youngsters uh, with using skills. They use it to youngsters with skills that are hard for them. Um, okay, so uh, over here, I go over like strategies that they share for addressing each individual executive function skill. As always, um, uh, yeah, like not going to have time for certain things, but I'll share the slides and all the resources so you can look at this on your own time. But there's individual strategies for each executive functioning skill. This should say, by the way, this is strategy taken from smart but scattered teens, which is for parents mainly focused towards adolescents. But you can, if, you, if you've thought about identifying what skill your child or student might be lagging, you can look here on these slides and say, okay, it's working memory and look at possible strategies. So let's roll through these and let's get to where this is. Okay, so let's think about, and this is kind of going to be a review. What is some overlap? some similarities between the work of Green and Dawson and Guar. So what are some key similarities? We see issues with the child. We see issues with the student. When they're asked to do something that is maladaptive, that mean maladaptive, it's not uh, meeting, okay? It's not meeting uh, 
with the skills that they possess. So they're being asked to do something which they don't have the skills to do yet is when we start to see these issues. They don't have those skills. So we might get very upset. It's like, why can't you do this? They don't have those skills to do that yet. And particularly, you know, this we're focused on students with learning differences. Very often with the learning difference, they just don't have the skills yet. And we need to help them with those skills in order to be able to do this. We need to have that approach of understanding this. Um, so what do we need to do at Kisil Mahe? We need to teach the skills and we need to be problem solvers together with the child. And in the case of Ross Green's approach, thinking what are solutions to this problem? What is the skill that they need help with? And what are solutions for helping them with the skill, developing the skill, but also reducing the impact. This is more from Dawson Guar's research, but reducing the impact, negative impact that the, that the skill deficit is having for the child. Because you can imagine how frustrating it is, is that simply I don't have that skill yet, but I'm being asked to do so much that needs the skill and no one's helping me with <laughs> developing the skill. Okay, um, key differences, key differences between them is green has more of a collaborative approach. So the focus is more on collaborating with the child and student to find solutions to the unsolved problems. And um, although Dawson Guar, they say incentives should come last, as I talked about at the beginning of the presentation, Green says more or less incentives should not even exist. We shouldn't even need them because students already want to do well. Students want to do well. So it's not a motivation thing. It's just lacking the skills thing. So by providing incentives and all that, like punishments reward for, the, for this to do better, we're not actually teaching the skill is his, what his research shows, okay? So putting it all together. So once again, I'm, like I've said this many times, Green is challenging us to be in a problem solving mode. This changes everything at some point. For, for me, it's really changed a lot of how I think about things. At the lowest level, we need to be, at the lowest level, like how we might, someone might approach this, is only thinking about the behaviors. But we need to remember that behaviors are just communication. It's that child or student's way of communicating the unsolved problem or lagging skill. So they're shouting or whatever, that's their way of communicating. I have an unsolved problem that I need help with identifying. And I have a skill that I need help developing. The level above that is thinking about solutions to these unsolved problems. So we're thinking about the solutions to these unsolved problems. But that's already a step above, going from thinking about the behavior to actually identifying what are unsolved problems and thinking about what are some solutions to these unsolved problems and lagging skills. The highest level, and this is more for Green's research, is finding solutions with the child, with the student, collaboratively, which simultaneously helps them develop the skills they're lagging is if they, together with you, solve these problems. And two things that I added in asterisk here that I think is really, really, it's, it's just, I, I really agree with this, is that it's bad parenting doesn't cause issues, which is something Ross Green talks a lot. Because we see parents who have a child who's doing very well and a child who's struggling. And very often, the difference here is just the skills, the skills that one is lacking, the skills that the other has developed. And, and that's why it says that it can't be from bad parenting. That, that's just not the case, that the evidence does not prove or show us or indicate that. And that a diagnosis doesn't tell us as much as what his assessment of lagging skills and unsolved problems would show. Um, so putting it all together, once again, students do well if they can. If they have these skills, they can do well. It's not students do well if they want. So we need to identify these lagging skills, identify the unsolved problems, solve the problems collaboratively, and focus on better communication to the student, with the student, and also about the student. When we're talking with each other, trying to figure out what's going on, focusing on this more productive and more skills-focused approach to communicating what might be going on, and focus on the skills. So for teachers, and I'll, I'll show the article where this is taken from at the end, but we, we need to aim to teach students about these skills explicitly if possible. Actually teach them and show, okay, these are these executive function skills. This one's about this, this one's about this, and help them with figuring out, help them become self-aware. Hey, hold on, which ones am I kind of seeing as an area of need for myself, but which ones am I good at as well? And then giving them the self-awareness and then the self-advocacy to say, okay, I need to work more on this skill. And here are some strategies I can use to work on this skill. So, you know, one thing I thought about, because obviously you can say I'm quite passionate about this, is because I really struggle with several of these executive functioning skills. And I'm a lot better now than I used to be. <laughs> when I was a student, 
middle school, high school, and middle school. You can imagine this was a lot worse for me. And there's lots of failures. And yeah, you build resiliency because you deal with a lot of failures because you're simply being asked for to do a lot of things that you don't have the skills to do yet. And no one's really helping you with the skills, which is happening to me, at least, you know, my memory is from that. Maybe there was there someone trying to help me and I wasn't being a good listener. But from what I remember, I, I wasn't explicitly being helped with these skills. And there were lots of failures. And what happens with many individuals, and we see this too, is that, you know, we hear this approach, we'll learn these skills, the, they'll learn these skills from failure. Failure and, you know, life is the best teacher. And this is, there's, there's truth to that. And the failures will teach the way to develop these skills. But we have to think when there's failure and failure and failure and failure, and these skills aren't being developed, at some point it gets to the point of one too many failures to the point of reduced motivation to even keep trying. And even worse than that, what we see sometimes is one big failure. Sometimes there's a lot of small failures, but sometimes it gets to that point of a big failure. And sometimes it's hard coming back from that big failure. So the key right here is we need to focus on is we need to help them as much as we can. You know, the term was used at the beginning, a surrogate frontal lobe. Remember, these skills don't fully develop to the age of 25. So it's, it's, it's inevitable, we cannot avoid it, that a student and child is going to struggle with some of these skills. And we need to help them with them through these different approaches as much as we can. Uh, I mean, Peg Doss and Richard Guard, they say, kind of similar to Vygotsky's zone of proximal development, support them, um, give them the support they need, but still give them the opportunity for them to be in, independent and develop these skills independently, but give them that extra, just that little bit of extra support they need, but, but not to the point of where, you know, you're doing everything for them. And, but we do need to think very carefully about the fact that we need to be aware of these skills, aware of helping them with these skills and look to be this surrogate frontal lobe to help them with developing these skills that are causing these challenges. So we, we can, as I go back to this failures, you know, saying failures and failures, we can't let them give up on themselves. We, we, we just can't let that happen. In a very good way through these failures, we can't let them give up on themselves. In a very good way to at least, at least try to make some kind of a impact here is to focus on these skills, identify the skills and try to identify these evidence, raw screen, evidence-based approach. Peg Dawson, Richard Gard, evidence-based approach to helping them with these skills so that these failures become a little bit less and we reduce this risk of not give, letting them give up on themselves. So the key sort of thing here in this from Ross Ringan, students do well if they can. It's not students do well if they want to, they do well if they can, if they have these skills. And wow, I, don't, I managed to end on the, the scheduled time. Uh, the last thing I'm gonna show, um, well, I did skip some things, but um, there's some bonus here that, you know, other people focus on sort of executive functioning skills in their work. That's incredible. Of course, like the key sort of thing I try to do in these presentations is if I read something or see something that I think is really worth sharing with anybody, I, I, I'd like to try to include it. And Atomic Habits, I think I've said in other presentations, it's an incredible book uh, about habits and habit building and habits in general has a lot of sort of overlap with some of the executive functioning skills. Um, and then Peg Dawson, Richard Guard, they have more research on something called executive functioning skill coaches. And this is essentially someone who's an executive functioning skill coach uh, for someone who struggles with executive functioning skills. Uh, and, you know, anyone can become an executive functioning skill. There's sort of a training that they have, but it could be a tutor, a teacher, an outside hired adult that can be specifically with the role of helping a child or student with executive functioning skills. So it can make a huge difference. Once again, it's evidence-based that an executive functioning skill coach specifically work on executive function skills can make a difference. Uh, I had a routine here. We won't have time to do that. In terms of resources, um, the resources I use specifically are cited here. Um, and I also added the Amazon link. So if you're interested in reading the full book, you'll get way better information, way clearer information, way more uh, uh, in, you know, you'll get the whole information from the actual books themselves. I just kind of summarize what, what I think is the key information. I probably get some things wrong too sometimes. So anyways, to get the key information right from the source, uh, I added the Amazon links. If you're interested, you just click on it, go to the link uh, for all of the sources I used, um, uh, all of them. 
uh, and then for Ross Green, paid Dawson Rajaguar. I also at the end of this presentation, so like I said, share the slides, really good videos where if you, you know, if you, you um, if not the book, these videos really give a good summary from Peg Dawson, from Rock Screen of what their ideas are all about. Really, really good. Um, and uh, some articles as well. I mentioned earlier for teachers, there's a great article from a great website called Attitude Mag. It's a website more for students with ADHD that talks about a teacher guide for executive functioning um, skills, um, for developing executive function skills. And for parents, there's two articles from Attitude Mag as well. Uh, other works, I added the websites of Ross Green and Peg Dawson and Richard Guar. Ross Green also made an amazing movie um, called The Kids We Lose. I haven't seen it yet. Uh, I've heard it amazing. I want to watch it, but I, I didn't share anything about it here because I haven't watched it yet. And also a book recently called Raising Human Beings that I'm definitely going to read and maybe in a future presentation talk about. And then I also have, yeah, their websites. And I want to say at the end, this is a new thing. Uh, here are links to the videos, the same videos, uh, I think the same videos from Ross Green and Peg Dawson with Japanese subtitles. So for the Japanese speakers, thank you so much for attending. I, I know I talk way too fast uh, sometimes and I'm sorry about that. Um, and, um, but uh, these videos have Japanese subtitles. So it'll be much you know, clearer information, I think a lot from these videos. And I also searched, uh, now I'm forgetting what the term is in Japanese, uh, but uh, if you, I, I put in a search for it on YouTube in Japanese and there's loads of videos on it loads of videos on uh, executive functioning skills, all in Japanese. A lot of them are related to ADHD, but loads of videos. So if you have time to watch those as well. And uh, last thing I'll share is uh, next presentation is on resiliency. And that's going to be on uh, April 15th at 7 p.m. Uh, so hopefully if that's interesting, uh, hopefully we'll see you then. So, and that's it. Uh, and yeah, that's that's the presentation and I'll share the slides as well. And now we have uh, some some time, six, seven. I guess we can go a little bit over uh, time for questions if there are any. I'll try my best to answer them. And like I said, for teachers who are on this presentation, if you have a um, if you have something you'd like to add in, if there's something I missed in the presentation or something you'd like to add to it or something maybe I got wrong, something like that, please uh, add, add something now. So should we open up for question and answers? Hello? Miss Sato or Jimbo? Oh, I guess maybe I'm the one who opens it up. So let, let's open up for uh, questions and answers if, if anyone's there. And uh, I think the way we're doing it, I forget the, the system, but if you have a question, you can maybe uh, turn on your microphone and say, I have a question and then I'll do my best to answer it. Or teacher, if you say, I want something to add or parent, you say, oh, I want to add something. Yeah. Um, Feel free to turn on your mic and, and, and go for it. Or not. <laughs> um, I could go back to a slide that I, I, I had to skip. Um, I'm very happy to ask, answer any questions, if there are any. I think many of us are sort of digesting <laughs> what you said. And um, many of us who are teachers and not parents have a lot of students in mind when you went through the list of um, sort of types of and how one depends on another. I think a lot of us had um, students come to mind. Mm, yeah, 100%, uh, especially, yeah. I um, think Carol has her hand up. Oh, really? You wanna say something, Carol? Yeah, you know, I'm always good for a comment, Nikolai. So um, yeah, don't be afraid to, uh, Roll the ball my way if you need uh, someone to get the ball rolling. Uh -huh. uh, I think one of the things that we should address is that parents may, you know, if we, you didn't bring up the concept of meeting kids where they're at, but I think when it comes to executive functioning, sometimes parents would actually be quite shocked to recognize 
to really realize, you know, at the, the level of executive functioning that their child is truly operating at. And how do we deal with that? And maybe as teachers as well, too. Like sometimes, I mean, I think we've all been surprised. Oh, this is actually <laughs> the students that Helen is laughing. You know, this is their, um, you know, this is where they're at. Okay. How do we... Um, you know, raise them up to the level that they need to be at. And, and yeah, so it's, it's, it's actually more of a question, right. For, for us to all think about and for parents to maybe, um, yeah, to be aware of, right. That, uh, it may be surprising, um, you know, because we think that they should be at a certain level and we think, well, maybe they're just a little bit below that, but a true ex- assessment would actually reveal that they're oh yeah. right i don't know That's yeah no no thank you so much actually i love um thank you so much for using the word assessment there i'd like to add two things uh number one is in their books like the full books um peg dawson and richard guar uh, like i said uh, smart but scattered those are more for parents um executive skills in children and adolescents that's more for teachers they have pages and pages of assessments for assessing accurately what exact executive functioning skills might my student, might my child be struggling with. So if it's not so clear to us, what exactly is executive functioning skill uh, my child is struggling with the most? And what are the skills that they're doing well in? If it's not so clear, those assessments are in their books. And I don't know, if, if you search online, executive function skill assessment, you might get one that's available online for free. And, but they exist. Assessments for executive function skills exist. In their books, they have loads of them and assessments for each executive functioning skill. The other point I wanna make, and thanks, thank you also, Carol, because a, a good summary as well here is, until that executive functioning skill is addressed, well, Let's look at it this way. Until that executive functioning skill deficit is identified, addressed, and developed, the same problem is going to continue to persist. Example, I really struggled with organization, planning, and time management when I was a student in high school. What happened? Very often, I didn't even know there was a test on the day there was the test and I would have to spend my lunch break for 50 minutes vigorously reviewing the material. And somehow I still ended up to do okay. Um, from those 50 minutes, a friend would say, hey, you ready for the test? I said, what test? What are you talking about? And this was a problem that persisted for quite a long time in high school until I, I really had to say, oh, okay, how can I work on these skills? And they fully developed later on in my life, but it, they got better and better slowly. But I can't even imagine how much better I would have been able to do had I explicitly been working on developing those skills that I was lagging in that were preventing me from being successful. And I see this so much with students. What's the main thing that's holding them back from being successful is that lagging executive functioning skill whether it's organization, so often, oh, I didn't write it down. And I didn't do it because I didn't write it down. Not because I can't like do it, not because I don't want to do it. I just didn't have a strategy to address that executive functioning skill I'm struggling with. So that's the key thing to sort of look at here is until that executive, lagging executive functioning skill is identified, addressed and developed, the same problems are going to persist. And the thing is, they're not going to just persist throughout school. They're going to persist after school and beyond that too. And let's hope once they turn 25, learning difference, maybe after that, they just develop on their own. But where do they get to on that journey towards 25 or 28? What kind of path are they on until that journey of 25 and 28? And how can we help them as they're on that path is something to think about. Hey, uh, Nikolai, this is Sean. Um, hey. Sean, say, hey, say uh, yeah, a great presentation. So thanks for everything that was um, um, really useful. Um, 
Yeah, one question I had, you know, when you were going through the the various executive functions, I, I got to admit, I was looking at some of them. I'm like, man, you know, I, I, some of these things I struggle with as well. And, uh, you know, and I was thinking, um, you know, when I look at, you know, you know my, my son, um, you know, I see there's a number of different areas that he struggles with, you know, almost top to bottom and, and, uh, and, you know, part of me, when I think about I'm sure I always think, well, are these, are these things that are standard for, you know, a kid growing up or, or these, you know, weaknesses. And so, I mean, how, as a parent, how do you kind of know, uh -huh. um, you know, when you say assessment, how do you know what's like, well, this is kind of standard for a kid growing up or, or what's, how do you know where, where, where a boy or, or your child is weak? Okay. Great question. Tough question. I'm going to do my best to answer it. Um, in regards to the assessment itself, um, as I was saying in these books, for example, they have assessments for the individual skills. So when you fill out an assessment that they have is in these books, so I, obviously I'm strongly like recommending to actually look at the book in the case of if it's an adolescent, you would do smart but scattered teams, right? And they have the assessment and here they give you a, a range of numbers and the range of numbers indicate what, what is perhaps advanced, you know, um, what would be, I, I can't remember the term they're using, is it expected? I, I think, I, I don't have it right in front of me right now, but they give you a, a range to really determine, okay, this is a major one. This is really an area of need to an area of, oh, this is an area of strength. And then they identify that middle range as, I, I guess expected, That's, but I could be wrong in my interpretation of that. Um, the other thing, and I, I'm not really totally sure this is answering your question, but, but the other thing, and I, I talked about that in the last presentation about self-esteem, is it's hard to kind of think about standards because every brain is unique in its own way with its own unique set of strengths and challenges. That's completely different from the next brain. And in, in executive functioning skills, yeah, like there, there, there's the, the ones that this person is stronger in and has challenges than this one. So there's not kind of a standard of where we're looking at in that sense. I don't think that's actually answering your question, but in, in terms of the standard, because there's certainly going to be some things that the child perhaps is better in and, and not as good in, or maybe there's one of, for example, one of the skills that the, you know, the child's, you know, might be very good in, for example, I, I see quite often very strong in that of emotional control, but struggling with, you know, for example, organizational planning, um, that, that happens as well. But in regards, I think a better answer to your question is the assessments for individual skills, um, kind of give a range like of, of the of like from this range to this range and i think expected Ooh. lies somewhere on that range um yeah. i hope i need to look at the book again but hopefully that kind of answered it yeah no, no that's that's uh that's helpful okay <laughs> thanks oh, thank you thank you um okay um of course I, I think i said this uh any presentation if you have a question you didn't have a chance to answer you think of later uh, my email, oops, I'll make sure to share it in the last slide. Uh, I'll share my email in the last slide. You can email me anytime, any question you didn't get to ask, and I will get back to you specifically. I'll also share any uh, websites or videos that are maybe specifically related to the question you're asking. Um, anytime you can email a question about that, and I would love to answer it. Um, so, so please feel free to do so. And I'll share my email at the end of this last slide, this one where I shared the day. I'll share my email on this slide so you can go to this slide and uh, send any questions to my email uh, and I'll send these slides as well to everyone later.